lady in the pink has it, give her a star. She gets cake, everyone gets cake. You need to use your infection control policies when you are conducting the one hour infection or when your employee is receiving the one hour, hour of infection control training that they are required to have prior to providing direct care to residents. We know our, our staff, have, our direct care staff have to have infection control training, yes? Yes, we don't get cited for 81 for that, no way. So when you're, there, you're conducting that one hour training for them, when they're taking that one hour training, they're being trained on your facility's infection control policy. Also, preventing abuse, your policies on that, recognizing reporting abuse and neglect and exploitation, your abuse policy must be used when your employee completes their abuse training. CPR. This is one of those things that used to make me see a little bit red. Are all of your staff required to be trained in CPR? How many do you have to have in the building at any one time? One. One person with current CPR. If you have a non-responsive resident, do you want that person to be able to perform CPR, but they've had training on it? Not training online. <laughs> I've watched many, I've watched, you know, I've watched Grey's Anatomy a lot. I don't think I can resuscitate someone based on that. You need actual training, hands-on, to follow the steps. So, the rule is now clear on that. They mu there must be documentation with the CPR training with your staff that it required your staff to demonstrate in person that he or she is able to perform CPR. So, hands-on training. It has to be approved by the American Red Cross, National Safety Council, the American Heart Association, or an organization whose training is accredited by the Commission on Accreditation for Pre-Hospital Continuing Education. I've said that four times and it's still a mouthful. Those are the, those are the authorities that approve or accredit the, the training. One other change related to that, there was a previously co previous conflict with the regulations with rule, where in one portion of the rule it indicated that a nurse is considered to have met the requirement for first aid and CPR, and in another place it said a nurse is considered to have met the requirement for first aid. It's only first aid. The nursing license does not mean that that person meets the requirement for your one staff in the building trained in CPR. Now we're going to talk about the additional training requirements for the unlicensed staff assisting with self-administration of medication. You heard all the duties. A fair number of them. My lady over here, yeah, yes, you, yes, you, no, I don't want you, if you're unlicensed, if you're not comfortable with your unlicensed staff doing vitals, you don't have to have them do okay. vitals, but that's a lot of duties. So your staff who currently have the four hours of required training as of the effective date of the rule, which was May 10th of this year, must receive an additional two hours of training that focuses on the additional duties allowed prior to assisting with these duties. So two hours specific to all of those additional duties. Going forward, your new staff that you're hiring as of May 10th are required to have six hours of medication training, which will also encompass those new duties. So, this language is straight out of rule. I'm going to paraphrase Kim. I didn't write it. Kim didn't write it. We didn't make it up. So, if you're asking, I don't want to have my staff do these new duties, the language in rule says that they have to have the additional training prior to doing the duties. Your staff always, always, always have to be trained to perform their duties. That's a requirement. So if they're not doing the new duties, right, based on us enforcing rule, we cannot require you to get that additional two hours of training for them. However, if the agency comes in your building and there is a concern that your unlicensed staff are performing duties outside of what they're trained for, that's an issue. I don't know about you, but I don't want my mother, you know, getting assistance with insulin from someone who's not trained to do it. So going forward, the requirement for new staff hired is six hours. Now the next question we get a lot, trained staff who have the required six hours of training, 
must receive a minimum of two hours of continuing education every year. Here's the other piece of good news for you, and it may be provided online. So the two-hour annual Medicaid, assisting with self-administration of medication update may be provided online. It does state your staff who have the required six hours of training get the two-hour update. Also, it says that they get a continuing education every year. So this is the other question we get a lot. If you're sending your unlicensed staff to get the two hours of training specific to the new duties, they are not going to require the two-hour update for another year. That's set. Staff who get six hours of training get a two-hour update after that. So they've met that requirement, no two hours until, at, until a year later. All medication training, all training, this is not changed, related to assisting with self-administration of medication, including the requirement for the new duties, has to be provided by a registered nurse 